This is George Dion of the Rock is George podcast, and this is a KNAC.com exclusive interview with solo artist Rick Emmett. Is that your personal guitar collection? It looks like a record store. <laughs> yeah, it does look like a guitar shop. It's Rick's Guitar Shop. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I like to use it as a uh, as a background because it's like every one of these things has a story, and this is the story of my life, kind of. So I go, eh. Now, I, I should say, I've purged the collection many times, and when my wife and I came and downsized here to this place, this was only a sort of a fraction of... I, I took a big chunk of guitars and put them in a room and I, went, my, I had my kids come over and say, pick one you like, build a shrine in your house to your old man and pick a gold or a platinum record. Go ahead, you know, so because I would only have room for this many. There, there's only about 40 or some odd guitars here in this room, but it's enough. <laughs> I, I talked to Jim Peterick of Survivor a couple times. He has 261 guitars. Yeah, I know. And, you know. He has even more, well, maybe not more, but he has a, a very extensive collection of sports cars, too. That is, oh, yeah. It's like, I never went there, and I never had the money to go there, but, you know, yeah, Jimbo, he's a great guy. I love him, and uh, and he's got some nice guitars. Wow. Absolutely. All right, Rick, why don't we get started? Yeah. If I knew absolutely nothing about Rick Emmett, how would you describe your solo music to me? Oh, uh, wow. Well, I would say, you know, it's an extremely eclectic range of stuff. I mean, you know, most folks know me because I'm the guy that played in Triumph. Obviously, that's the identity that I still carry decades later. But, you know, I went on to make records that were, uh, wow, you know, wide ranging. So I, eclectic is the word I would have to use, that that I played lots of different styles and, and uh once the mainstream wasn't really interested in me and I wasn't really interested in them anymore either, I started, you know, uh, indulging myself for, uh, like you can see archtop jazz guitars. Uh, I did classical guitars. There they are at the end. Like there was a lot of stuff that in my life I'd always wanted to do. And then once I went, well, I don't care about the charts anymore. I don't care about radio or any of those things. I'm just going to make records and see if there's enough, sort of loyal fans that'll come to my, my website and, and order, you know, stuff. And fortunately there was enough that I could keep indulging my, my eclectic tastes. <laughs> so, but the, the stuff that we're here to talk about, the diamonds package, that was the stuff. There was three albums I made after I left triumph and I was still kind of thinking, Oh, you know, the first one, absolutely. I was thinking, Oh, hard rock. got to get on FM AOR radio. Uh, and then uh, the, the label I was on in the States, Charisma, went bankrupt and, and disappeared overnight after they'd only serviced two songs to radio. And it was like, OK, well, the, that one's that one's gone. And then the second album was a bit schizo because radio was changing in a big way and had gone to Seattle grunge and and, uh, you know, everything was Nirvana, Soundgarden, uh, Stone Temple Pilots. uh uh, Pearl Jam, you know, so it was like they didn't, they weren't really interested in no fart like me anymore. So I, I was already sort of changing what I was doing. Uh, and then the last, the third record I made for Duke Street, which is the stuff that we called for the uh, Diamond stuff. I think we took two tracks from that, the hardest part and, and, um, and a pendulum and th they weren't real they were hard rock but they they had some you know electric guitar stuff that was sort of you know especially the hardest part there's a solo on there where, uh there was a long out the drummer had just played time and the organist played and so then when i soloed it was going to be a solo and then it was going to be a fade on the record and i had so much fun it was just a single take and i finished and i went you know what we're just going to let that run right out to the dead end and uh I don't care. Like it was a nutsy. I was playing weird stuff up the neck, like, uh, yeah, this stuff with flat fives and things, doodly, 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 like crazy runs and stuff. But I was going, yeah. And little did I know that you know, four decades on, we would be putting it out on a compilation package. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the name of the compilation we're talking about is Diamonds, the Best of the Hard Rock Years, 1990 to 1995. It's out now in the U.S. through Deco Entertainment, in Canada through Music in Motion Entertainment. Uh, I think it's been well documented what led to your departure from Triumph to your solo career. So I'd, I'd ask, was there a lot of pressure uh, going solo and releasing Absolutely? There was, but, you know, I was a young man and I could handle pressure. You know, uh, I, I I wouldn't have left if I didn't think I could cut it. And, you know, uh, it was maybe a little bit more than I bargained for because the, the leaving of Triumph ended up being very bitter and hard. Um, and I had four kids at home and, and was trying to figure out a new balance in my life. Um, so there was all of that. But uh those three albums, I mean, the 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 guy that ran Duke Street, Andy Herman, nice guy, you know, I mean, all of this is precipitated. The, the fact that I'm talking to you and this package is on is because Andy went, you want your master's back? Yeah, sure, you can have them. Well, so that was nice. And so I went, well, I guess instead of sitting around on them, I guess I should maybe try and do something with them. So, um, yeah, and it was a nice period in my life. I was being managed by a guy named Ross Monroe. He became, you know, like just a really, really good friend for the rest of my life. And I was out to dinner with him last week and and his wife. And and uh, so th there's lots that I look back on and I go, it, it was a it was a sweet time, you know, in, in some regards, while lawyers were fighting over the, you know, over the whole uh, severance from triumph kind of thing. But and I should mention this, George, I um like this album was kind of supposed to come out when my memoir came out, like Triumph did a documentary and, and it came out at the rock and roll machine and it was, you know, well uh, publicized and promoted. And, you know, I attended uh, launches and premieres and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm in good with the boys and it, that was, it was all good, but it was their story. It wasn't mine, you know? So then I thought, I think I should write a memoir. And, I, you know, at least at the record street, because my life was not just triumph. You know, my life was, uh, you know, I wanted to tell the story of where I how I grew up and the kind of kid that I was and all of that stuff. And then after I left triumph, I made more records after I left triumph than I made when I was in it. So there was a lot of story that I wanted to tell that wasn't in that documentary. So it came out last October. It was called Land on the Line. Pretty straightforward kind of title you know, telling the truth about my life. And Diamonds was supposed to come out at the same time. The guy, Greg Campbell, and his, they didn't quite get it. <laughs> took him a few months. Well, took him about five months. So here we are, we're talking and we're finally promoting it. But in a way, it, Diamonds is also a, a, a bit of a story of my life, but that chunk of my life, I fully intend to have another compilation come out at a later date that will be some of the other stuff that I've done. Um, yeah, so, you know, and, and meanwhile, I, I keep writing, I keep playing, you know, th there will be other, uh, I've got a book coming out. I just did a, a, a project where I wrote, uh, 10 guitar pieces on a Telecaster style guitar. And then I wrote a book about that creative process. And so then I have this book and I have this record and I went to ECW press, the people that put out my memoir and they went, oh, this is great. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's do this. You know, um, so that's going to be coming out, um, but you know who who knows? Hopefully this year, hopefully twenty twenty four. I don't know, you know. But I I I keep being creative, I keep chasing it, and uh, I, I don't intend to stop, even though I'm now in my senior years. <laughs> Well, Rick, I, I have to say you're very good at anticipating my questions because you've <laughs> answered a bunch of questions that haven't even come up yet. It's awesome. <laughs> That's good. Now we so now we can talk. You know, how's it going, George? What what are you up to lately? <laughs> well, when it comes to greatest hits compilations, it, it it can't be easy picking the songs you want, especially where you know you're putting it on the vinyl format. You only have so much space and things like that. Uh, the compilation is kind of heavy on the absolutely stuff, but uh, I would imagine it was just difficult overall in putting what you wanted on this together. Well, of course, uh, you know, everyone's got an opinion. And this guy, Greg Campbell, that runs uh, Rock Paper Merch, you know, and it was his label. It's He's the guy that's putting it out. So, you know, his, his opinion kind of counts. And it's not like I haven't been down the road in terms of record companies and 
and producers and, you know, and then there was a guy, Vic Branco uh, at Iguana Studios, and he did a really nice job of remastering the stuff. And so that enters into it. It's like, what kind of, uh, once we are creating a package, what stuff kind of hangs together sound wise, you know, and, and um, that's part of it. How does it, how does it, um, it sequence, you know, like uh, how will it flow? Uh, so that became a, a, a part of it. Um, and I, I, you, I think your observation is correct that there, it's a little bit absolutely heavy, except that was what I figured was the hardest of the rock and stuff. The, the ipso facto, there was, a, I mean, Bang On is a pretty hard rock and song, and, and Rainbow Man is very kind of hard, psychedelic, Hendrixy. You know, there's it, the ipso facto, it was the second of the three albums in that period. And it was more where I was kind of writing R and B, Stevie Ray meets West Montgomery meets Motown kind of music, and because I was changing, and I was growing up, you know, um, as a, as a songwriter, as a, as a musician, as a recording artist, and I was less and less concerned with whether or not radio was interested in me. Uh, but then I had the record company going, oh, geez, Rick, you gotta. Come on, man. Well, you got to rock. There's got to be some hard rock. So I went back into the studio and cut like straight up is on is on diamonds. And it's like, you know, Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, guitar hero ish kind of stuff, you know. Um, so uh, that was kind of what I was thinking. That, that stuff, it'll hang together because it's a very electric guitar oriented, you know, those tracks because I was starting to get very acoustic oriented on other things that I was doing. And I went, well, let's avoid that for this package for now. Let's do the singer songwriter acoustic -y things later uh, and, and get into that on some other compilation. This will be the hard rock years. And, you know, so. I got you. So you mentioned the ipso facto stuff, Rainbow Man, fantastic track. I'd never heard that before. That, that, that was pretty good. I, I read that the album as a whole, was you kind of grasping with grace, faith, hope, and love at the time with things that were going on in your life? Yeah, it's become a theme that I almost, uh, it's now my universal kind of thing. I make music, uh, all music, of uh, and seek the idea of good faith with, with an audience. Like, how do I keep faith with uh, whatever it is that I'm chasing on their behalf? Uh, and then the, just the fact that I love music so much that uh, I always want that joy to be a part of wh whatever it is that I'm doing. It, whether the song is a bluesy, you know, uh, heartbreaking kind of thing, I think that good faith that you're still, I, I'm still a believer in in love. And so, you know, hope is the kind of the, <laughs> you fill the balloon with some, some hot air and some helium and, and you, you, you hope it floats, you know. Um, and I, I don't think it keeps me from um, sometimes getting heavy and and uh, even having anger. But uh, the next step for that, and, and I, you know, I, I think you're right. Ipso facto was an album that was kind of like a stepping stone for me to start learning this, that, that um, you know, when you make music, you've always got to be asking yourself the next question. So, you know, you, you, you do something and you go, okay, this is my initial creative thing and I'm, I'm angry. Uh, gee, I'm, I got to work this out, you know. Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, why? Why, do you, why are you working it out? And it's because, well, because I, I, I want to see if I can't find an answer. And so, the, for me, music is always about maybe trying to find some kind of answer for whatever question it is that I have, you know. And... Um, I'm I'm not religious. Yeah, uh, you know, I want to make sure that uh, I make that kind of clear. Uh, uh there's no religion that I would buy into. <laughs> and uh, there, there's no idea of um afterlife or or, you know, a supreme being that that I'm espousing. But I do believe that uh there is a thing that's that human spirit thing, that spiritual value of us trying to be good to each other and trying to live by the golden rule. And, you know, that's a hope, faith, love kind of a thing. And so I share that with the religious folks and I go, Hey, I'm a humanist. I'm secular, but 
you know, I think good faith, that's why I make music. So hopefully, you know, I'm not um, alienating anybody. You know, I would go, hey, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, come on into the tent. I, you know, this is the music tent. In this in this tent, I, I'm good about, like, come on, look at these guitars. Like, I'm good for almost any style. I'm good for almost any approach, you know. I, I'm willing to take a crack at it. As a part of this Diamonds collection, uh, in the deluxe version of the package, there's two songs that have never been heard. They're demos. Uh, you revealed what they were in a live stream that I was not privy to. So, what are the what are the two uh, tracks that have been unheard up to this point? Yeah, one song is called "Kiss It All Goodbye." The other one's called "The Treadmill." And "Kiss It All Goodbye" was during the ipso facto stage of things. And uh, I was uh, working, I, the, the drummer in my uh, touring band at the time was Greg Critchley. And Greg had a very good pop sense of things. He'd been in a band that was called Regatta, which was kind of like a police band, you know, police covers. the. But, but Greg was hip. And uh, I think he ended up going to L.A. and like producing Hillary Duff albums and stuff, you know. Um, but, he, he, you know, good engineer, really solid drummer. Um, and, and Greg sort of when in the initial stages, I was trying to figure out like pop songs. And so I wrote kiss it all goodbye. And I think my manager and even the, the, some label guys went, well, it's too obvious, Rick, to, to pop, you know, uh, no, let's not, let's not keep chasing this one. Let's not master this one up. Let's not cut it with a band. So it's just a demo, but you know, Greg Campbell, the guy from, uh, this record label was going like, Hey, what do you got that you've never released before? I go, well, Usually, uh, my my process it's a fairly clean one. I don't have a lot of junk lying around. When I figure out this is a song that I like, then my my own ability to be able to sit here in the studio and, and play it and 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 make a demo of it, you know, like I just do them on my iPhone now. But I, then you, I've got the song. You can tell whether or not the song is hanging together or not, you know, before you even c cut it with a band. So kiss it all goodbye. We did put like, you know, some machine drums on it and stuff. But yeah, so that was the one. The other one was I had got money when I first left Triumph. I had, uh, got a development deal with Epic Records uh, in Canada. But so it was CBS in Canada. But they were like Epic was a sub label and uh, they wanted to make it and then pitch it to Epic in the States. And I did six songs for them. And then they passed. They, they didn't want me, <laughs> which, you know, I should have seen it as a harbinger of things to come, you know. Um, uh, anyhow, so because, you know, the label that Jeff Beck was on didn't want a guitar player guy. You know, you go, whoa, geez, OK, I guess the business is changing. Um, so uh, but I written the song about the Irish troubles, you know, because uh, the name Emmett is an Irish kind of name. And there's very famous uh, uh, patriots, Irish patriots, named Emmett in the in the history of Ireland. That that uh, one of them didn't do very well. His head ended up on a pike. <laughs> but the English, you know, decided, oh, we're going to make an example of this guy. Um, anyhow, so uh, yeah, so that that uh, that song was kind of progressive, uh, like a Led Zeppelin-y kind of floating song and then heavy rock and then back to floating again. And and um, I, I was co-writing with a guy named Graham Shaw. And uh, when I played that for him, Graham said, this is good. It just needs a little refrain. Like you just need at one point to sing like, uh, and, and it all goes on, it all goes on like a little refrain. And I went, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I, he and I did a demo and recut it. Uh, it didn't make the final cut to, for the album. And then when uh, Campbell was putting this package together and, of course, trying to dredge up things that would be new and never heard before, he got in touch with Graham and said, hey, Graham, will you sign off your rights on this thing? And, and Graham went, yeah, yeah, sure. Send me a couple of bottles of wine. By the way, a couple of bottles of wine is what it cost me to get the three albums of Masters back from Andy Hermant. Like, nice guy. So I want to make sure it when I acknowledge that publicly like thanks andy that was that was big hearted of you that was kind he didn't have to but you know i think part of it is you know here in canada we have different copyright laws than you do in the united states
But in the United States, I think in Congress, they passed some stuff where they went, well, after 25 years, whatever uh, uh, existed in terms of rights for masters, publishing, that kind of stuff, it reverts to the artist. So I think a lot of folks are kind of looking at that and going, well, you know, the time's run out. Sure, let them have it back. Who cares? It's, <laughs> you know, the law has run out. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about the deluxe version of Diamonds. It's limited to 400. Uh, it has the CD, the LP on a fantastic looking space effect vinyl, handwritten lyrics, unseen images, guitar picks from each album, a poster. How, how There's a lot more to it, but how involved were you in putting the package together? Or was this all Greg from Rock Paper Merch? No, uh, I was heavily involved, and I'll tell you why. Because the guy that originally had sort of cooked the deal with Greg, he's a guy that works for me, Rick Spud Wharton, and I love Spud dearly, but he got really sick, and he dropped out of the, like, literally was in the hospital for a while, and he's better now, thank goodness, you know. Um, But uh, so it was like I had to step in, and then it was like this guy Greg is going like, well, are there pictures that you have? Can you go through your stuff and find, like, oh, yeah, so you've got some. Um, it was like I had slides from back in the day. It was like, no, I got now I got to get them digitized. And then he's going, oh, we can do postcards. Uh, approve seven or eight pictures, Rick, and we'll do postcards. And then the big one, which you know, I'm gonna you know spend some time here on your show to chastise Greg a little bit. He made me handwrite lyrics, and so I had to sit down and handwrite lyrics of songs. And and I, they were I I, I was meticulous i was careful i did a nice job i sent them to him courier you know uh and then it's getting down to the the short strokes from putting the package out and he goes rick i can't find the lyrics i've lost the lyrics and i'm going how could you do that like that was really important and don't make me do that again and he goes well you're gonna have to do it again like and sends me just you know like a little short email that goes hey, you're gonna have to do it again i'm going oh no Oh, no, that's not how this works. Like, I'm not the idiot that lost them. You're like, I sent you, I even used my phone and took pictures of the PDFs. And I said, look, aren't they lovely? Look at these. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to send these to you, you know, courier them to you. So I said, you're going to have to use the PDFs or something. I'm not redoing them. And so then, you know, a couple of weeks go by and he goes, oh, I found them. And I go, oh, you found them. Oh, isn't that great? You know, uh, so anyhow, yeah. And and I would have to approve these things because, you know, the guy that would normally be my gatekeeper who would do the stuff, he wasn't around. So it was like I had to step in in the breach and I go, OK, yes, I'll I'll be the executive producer of this project. God damn it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but in the end, it was all right. You know, you, you hope that you've kind of left a lot of that BS stuff behind when you're not really in the mainstream music business anymore. Apparently not, George. Apparently, it never goes away. Well, in addition to handwriting all those lyrics, you had to sign 400 copies of the album too, right? Yes, yes. Which is why my hand no longer works properly. <laughs> why it's just hanging here like a dead fish. No, you know, I mean, I'm used to that. Back in the day with Triumph, I can remember once uh, going up to Montreal, a uh, Canadian distributor, and I, it was maybe the Never Surrender album or something like that, and sitting in a room where they were going to be sending out posters and pictures, all the record stores, uh, and then uh, contest winners. There was some sort of contest that was running. So there were all these things, and it was literally like a thousand posters uh, 500 pictures i was there for hours like just signing stuff signing stuff signing stuff you know um so you know i mean it, it just goes with the territory right like the last phase of my career when i was to- out touring uh and the people that would book me they would say rick you, you got to do a meet and greet after the show and i went i don't like meet and greets you know they, i go yeah but you have to do it like if you want this kind of a paycheck for playing the gig this is now part and parcel of the contract you must make and you'll have to do a meet and greet after and i go i don't want to do a meet and greet <laughs> well, well i'm sorry you know and so you'd play a whole gig and i'd be tired and i wouldn't want to sit down and you know 
have a cup of tea, relax. Nope. Got to just towel off and go on out to the table and sign, sign, pose for a picture. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, yeah, hello, sign. And be friendly, be nice, smile, you know, act like this is something you love. You just love the, and I do love the people. I, I, and, I and I love, well, I love most of the people. <laughs> There's some people. <laughs> Some people I don't love. Yeah, can I tell you a story, George? One yeah. time I played a place called the Tupelo Music Hall in uh, New Hampshire. I think it's New Hampshire. And um fly into Boston, you know, drive, go play this. And it was just me and a duo thing, me and another guitar player, Dave Dunlop. Uh, and so I, I get about three songs in, and you can probably tell I'm a chatty guy. Like, you know, um, I like to tell stories. And when you're doing a kind of a, a duo or acoustic kind of, it's, it's a storyteller kind of a thing, right? So I get about three songs in and I've been telling these stories and I, I'm about to do another song and I launch into the story and a voice from out of the darkness yells at me and goes, why don't you shut the fuck up, man? Just play music. Right? And I go like, what? And the, the crowd kind of goes, oh, because, you know, most of these folks, they like me, you know? This guy apparently didn't really know who I was and didn't know what he was getting himself into. And so I had to say to the guy, look, buddy, you know, if you want to leave, go and get your money back, feel free, you know. But I tell stories. It's it's who I am. It's what I do, you know, like like it or lump it. You're going to have to lump it. So, you know, and he, did, he got up and he, and he stormed out like, yeah, blah, 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 as he was walking up, the leaving the leaving the venue. I go. Okay. You know, Georgia takes all kinds. The world is wide. <laughs> it takes all kinds. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I threw in a song title there. You probably didn't know that's what I was doing. And then you answered me by throwing <laughs> throwing back an album title at me. That was good. Well, those are all the questions I have for you today, Rick. The new album is Diamonds, the best of the hard rock years, 1990 to 1995. Out now through Deco Entertainment in the U.S., Music in Motion in Canada, and you can order it at rockpapermerch.com. Thanks, George. This has been fun. It was absolutely a good time talking to you, Rick, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again in the future. I look forward to it. When the 10 Telecaster Tales comes out, I'm calling you. <laughs>